Uh, if you would, go in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to continue this morning with a series I started several weeks back entitled Get Right or Get Out. And what we're doing is we're going through 1 Corinthians 5 where the Bible actually lists several specific sins that would get a person kicked out of church. And some people, uh, that's kind of a profound concept that that a church would actually kick people out of it. You know, people uh, often assume that you know, a church is, is so desperate to just get as many people as they can in there that they would never even dream of kicking somebody else or s- kicking somebody else, anybody out, excuse me, but the, it's a biblical concept, you know, and it's not something that we enjoy doing. It's not something that we look forward to having to do. But, you know, this book is our final authority, and we have to learn to let this book determine how we're going to live our lives, how we're going to, you know, run a church. And Paul makes it really clear here. Can somebody close that blind right there, just that one right straight ahead of me? That'd be great. Thank you. Um, so we have to go to the book and say, well, what does the book say about this? And I don't know how you can read 1 Corinthians 5 and other passages and, and walk away saying, you know, nobody has a right to, uh, to kick somebody else out of church. Now, of course, you know, that's up to, it's up to church leadership to exercise that discipline, and, and, and the congregation definitely has a part to play when it comes to church discipline. And you say, why are you preaching this? Are you fixing to kick people out of church? No, you know, but this is just one of those things. To be perfectly honest, the way I was even inspired to preach through this series is I was making clips of Pastor Anderson's preaching, and he touched on this, and he said, boy, that'd be a great series for somebody to preach through. And I thought, well, here am I. Send me. I'll, I will preach it. So it's not that I have anybody in mind. You know, I'm not, I don't operate like that. I'm not trying to prepare you for some great purge or something like that. But it's good to keep these things in front of us. It's good to remind ourselves of, you know, there is a potential that if, if, we, if we start, you know, living loose and letting sin creep into our lives, it can get to a place that, you know, we're, we could find ourselves on the receiving end of church discipline. So really the whole thing is just a, it's a preemptive, you know, uh, attack, you know, if you will, or it's a, uh, you know, it's a maintenance sermon or maintenance series is what we're doing. And again, we're just going through 1 Corinthians 5, and we're looking at every one of these sins individually. And today we're going to talk about railing. You know, the Bible talks, oh, excuse me, that's not the one I want to talk about. That's this evening. All right, so now I've already given myself away. We're doing, we're doing idolatry. Where did I put that? Don't tell me I put misplaced my notes. No, there should be a, there should be a sermon around here somewhere. <laughs> I pulled it out. I don't know where it went. There it is. I found it. Got it right here. So we're going to actually doing idolatry. That comes first. So excuse me. So first of all, again, as I was saying, you know, church discipline is a biblical concept. You know, it's not something that we're just pulling out of thin air. It's not something that we just practice because we enjoy, you know, being bullies or something like that. It's a biblical concept. And if you've been following out the series, you probably already know about it. You know, it lists it very clearly there in 1 Corinthians 5 that certain people will be put out of the congregation. And, you know, I've, I've, I've preached several sermons on this, and I've gotten some feedback, you know, uh, from the online crowd. You know, nobody in church has contacted me and voiced any displeasure over what I'm preaching concerning this series. But, um, you know, I, I read one uh, sub-genius's comment on there saying, you know, hey, th- th- what, you know, you're, he was complaining about the sermon the series title get right or get out and he said get right or get out what a proud arrogant statement for somebody to make man you're so puffed up to 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 put it that way and i said well would you prefer the way paul put it deliver such an one unto satan for the destruction of the flesh you know and and here's the thing uh there's nothing proud or arrogant about this concept you know we don't you know if somebody's uh, being disciplined by the church it's not because you know, the person in charge has, you know, some, uh, it's just a megalomaniac who's out there to just beat his chest. You know, it's because it's biblical. Look there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. <clears throat> in fact, Paul says it's arrogant and, 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 and puffed up to tolerate sin in the church. That's what he says here in verse 1. It says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so as much as named among the Gentiles that one would have his father's wife. Verse 2, and ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away 
from among you. So it's act, the irony is it's actually the complete opposite. That the, the arrogancy, the being puffed up there, that's what it's referring to, the, the, the pride, the arrogancy, is, is actually found when you're not kicking people out of church. You know, that's the irony, to sit there, oh, who do you think you are to kick somebody out of church? Well, who you are to, to, to let somebody who's guilty of these sins stay in a church? And what's the point? What's the purpose behind this? It's because as he says in 1 in, in, in Corinthians 5, that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. The reason why you have to deal with these sins this way is because if, if you tolerate it in a church, if you don't mourn and you don't take that person away from among you, like leaven, it will, it will leaven the whole lump. You know, somebody will say, oh, that person's living in fornication and, you know, the, and, and, and everyone knows it and they're here and they're fine and it's tolerated. And then you have young people in the church that see that, you know, and they're going through that a phase in their life where that's a real strong temptation. And they might just be like, well, if the church is okay with it, I'm just going to go ahead and do it. I mean, I know the Bible says it's wrong, but, you know, these guys are in church. They seem happy. They seem blessed. There's no discipline there. <clears throat> and what I really like about this is that, you know, Paul was so, quote, unquote, puffed up and so arrogant that he even made this call without even being there. If you look there in verse 3, he said, For vi ver I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit have judged already though as if I were present, as though I were present. I mean, he wasn't even there to get the, the whole story. I mean, he knew enough to just say, look, you need to get that guy out of there. He doesn't belong there. You need to kick him out. And what did he tell him to do? Look in verse 5. To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. You know, I wonder how many, if that's going to hurt some people's feelings. If I... If I had titled the series that, Delivering Such Unto Satan, uh, Destroying the Flesh, you know. So this, this the title of the series, uh, Get Right or Get Out, you know, it's, it's supposed to, you know, the, the, the obviously the purpose behind it is that people would not get kicked out of church. That they would either get right or they would keep themselves right and then we wouldn't find ourselves guilty of these sins so that we wouldn't have to deal with any of this. That's the point. And here's the thing, people who have a problem with this, people who have, you know, have, obje have objections to this kind of church discipline, you're probably people that would end up having to be purged themselves. You know, a lot of times they're like, people, people would see something like that take place, you know, oh, you kick so-and-so out for such and such a sin, or they, you hear this preached, they have a problem with it, you start to wonder, why do you have a problem with it? I mean, if, it's not gonna get, if you're not you know, going to get kicked out, what are you so worried about? But sometimes you've got to kind of scratch your head and say, well, why does this bother you so much? And of course, when it comes to the, a lot of the online community, you know, I'm not saying everybody, but a lot of the goofballs that comment out there, you know, they, a lot of times, they're not even in a church to get kicked out of. You know, they've already, uh, you know, proven themselves, you know, unworthy. They, they can't even get, have enough character to even get in a church, but they want to, you know, comment and tell a church how it ought, how it ought to be run. They want to criticize and, 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 you know, and, and, and rail, quite frankly. I'll, that, I'll get into that tonight. But, uh, but today we're not talking about fornication, obviously. I'm just laying this groundwork again. Because this, even just this concept of people being kicked out of church can be very foreign to us. And uh, we need to make sure that we understand that this is something that this church practices, that has practiced, and, you know, hopefully won't have to, but will practice if needed. So it says here, uh, we're going to talk about idolatry. That's one of these many sins uh, that can get you kicked out of church. So what is idolatry, right? Obviously, you know, we probably have a very, you know, most people probably understand what idolatry is. I mean, it's the worship of the depictions of false gods. You know, it's the statue of Mary. It's the statue of Buddha. It's the actual making an, a graven image and then worshiping it, Okay. Now, if you would, um, go over to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. You're going to Exodus chapter 20. Uh, it says in Leviticus 26, Ye shall make uh, no idols, nor graven image, neither rear up a standing image, neither shall ye set up, neither shall ye set up any image of stone in your land to bow down unto it, for I am the Lord your God. So God couldn't be any clearer in the Old Testament and elsewhere that he does not want us worshiping idols, okay? Not to make any graven image, not to make any image of stone. And, you know, we have a lot of people today, they do this. I mean, the Catholic Church obviously is, is what comes to mind in most people's minds. 
And that's probably one of the few examples that we have in this country of idolatry. I mean, we could, but you, if you go over to places like India and China, you know, different parts of the world, they practice idolatry every bit as much, if not, it's probably even more prevalent in a society other than ours. And, you know, that's because of their religion. You know, Buddhism, they, they, they do that. Hinduism, um, they have a lot of idolatry in, in these religions too. But no, no, make no mistake about it, we have it here as well. And the Catholics, they have a lot of, and I've t preached about this previously, and I really don't want to go into it at great detail to try and debunk Catholics. You know, you, it, it, they say, well, it's not idolatry. We're not really worshiping these statues. You know, and you guys that have been coming here, you know, I've held up the pictures of the Pope kissing the little statue, baby Jesus' foot, kissing the statue Mary on the forehead, bowing down to them. And you could call it whatever you want, it's worshiping. If that's not worshiping it, I don't know what is. Okay? It is idolatry. It's the making of an image. I mean, even if you want to say, okay, well, I'm not worshiping it. You know, God forbids just making it. I mean, look here in Exodus chapter 20. Is that where you went? Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or it is in the water under the earth. So he says, first of all, don't even make it. So I don't even care if you want to say, well, I'm not going to bow down to it. I'm not going to worship it. Even owning it, even making it is a sin. And if we're being really honest, the purpose behind making these things is so that people can worship them and so that they can venerate it, whatever you want to call it. It's idolatry. He said, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. I mean, how many pictures do you have to see of the Pope bowing down to these things? I mean, it's their, it, to deny that is, it would be ridiculous. Uh, For I am the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So he said, well, what's the big deal? I mean, if we're making a statue of you know, the supposed Jesus, you know, this, this image that they, somebody conjured up in their mind many hundreds of years after he walked this earth and said, this is what Jesus looks like, when nobody has any idea what he looked like. But I can guarantee you one thing, he wasn't Caucasian. <laughs> when, you're, when, you're, when you're born in, in Israel back then, you know, you probably had brown skin. But what are all the depictions of Jesus that we see today? The white guy, you know, they look more like me, right? <laughs> so that's, that's inaccurate, first of all. But here's the thing. Why, what's, well, you say, well, what's the harm? What's, well, who, you know, what's the harm? I mean, it's Jesus. You know, it's the, Mother Mary, it's the Mother Mary. It's the saints that we're worshiping. These are, you know, biblical characters. What's the harm in this? Well, when you're worshiping it, when you're venerating, when you're bowing down to it, you know, you're, 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 uh, you're giving that, which is, that glory which is due unto the Lord, unto an image, unto a statue. And that's why he says there at the end, I am a jealous God. He said, why shouldn't you, why, why did he not want them to have no other gods before them? Why did he say that they should not make thee any graven image or any likeness that is in the heaven above? He ends it by, he says, because I am a jealous God. I mean, be just like if my, my children, you know, I'm, I'm taking care of my children, providing for them, looking after them, nourishing them, clothing them, feeding them, giving them, you know, keeping them safe. And then they're going to go call some stranger daddy. You know, I, I come home from work and I, and I want my, some affection for my kids that I've been working hard for all day. And they just walk right by me and go out across the street and hug the neighbor and say, I'm glad you're home, Dad. <laughs> you know, he's not paying the bills. He, I mean, he might have his own kids or whatever. It's kind of like that. I mean, it's kinda, that's kind of an, the analogy that kind of help you understand why God would be upset about it. I mean, any one of us as a parent or a father would be upset about that. If our children started to, you know, give the credit for, for their, uh, you know, for their having been taken care of to somebody else. If they started to thank somebody else for all the, the groceries and everything else that, that they were able to, to have. But go over to Deuteronomy chapter 27. So again, I just want to talk about the fact that, you know, I don't care whether you want to say you worship it or not. Once, you, once you've even gone so far as even making an idol, you're already in sin. I mean, if you make an idol and you, you know, want to do whatever after that point you know just hang hang some flowers on it put some beads on it i mean i don't care you made it you're in sin okay <clears throat> look at 
Look here in Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 15. Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image. I mean, you want to get the curse of God in your life? Go make a molten image. Go make a graven image and call it God and worship it. He said, an abomination unto the Lord. So, I, you know, and he, and he said, any graven image is an abomination to him. I don't care what name you slap on it. It's the mother, it's the queen of heaven. It's the mother Mary. It's Jesus. It's one of the saints. It's the apostles. I don't care whose name you put on it. He says, any molten image is an abomination unto the Lord. The work of the hands of the craftsmen and put it in a secret place. All the people shall answer and say, Amen. He said, Look, this isn't up for debate. There's no gray area here. Any graven image, anyone who makes it, is cursed. It's an abomination. Idols are an abomination. <clears throat> and you say, Well, I just don't, I disagree. You know, I have my reasons as to why I think that, you know, there's nothing wrong with it to use it in religious worship and so on and so forth. You know, you go ahead and feel that way, but you know what you just did? You, when you start to argue with, with the Bible, when you start to, you know, try to reason your way around clear scripture, you just made an idol out of your own reasoning. Because now you're the authority. Now you're going to worship your own reason, your own reasoning more than what the Bible actually says. Now you're the authority. You know, now you've just made an idol out of that. You know, maybe not physically, but, you know, intellectually, you've, you've said, well, I know that's what the Bible says, but... I'm going to usurp the authority of Scripture because of, I, because of my feelings or whatever. I mean, the Bible could not be any clearer that idols are an abomination and that he, God doesn't want us making them. And again, you know, it's more prevalent in some cultures than other, others. You know, go over to Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2. No, I don't think anybody in the room this morning is struggling with this. I don't th I don't, at least I hope not. <laughs> I don't think anyone's going to go home today after church and, you know, have, have, make lunch or dinner or whatever and then take a small portion aside and go set it in front of some statue. You know what I mean? And leave it there. And obviously this, this isn't something that's you know, a, we see a lot of in our culture, but it is there. Um, you know, we don't have to go, I mean, go down to San Xavier Catholic, actually don't go, but just look at it online like I did. You know, this church down here, this ancient Catholic church, San Xavier, just south of here, I mean, that place is a great example of idolatry. It's filled with it. And, you know, and they call it religious art. And God calls it idolatry. And it doesn't matter if it's in a so-called church building or what name you associate, associate with that idol. At the end of the day, that idol, God considers it an abomination. And, you know, again, the reason we're preaching this is because this isn't something we want to fall into. We're probably less likely to have to deal with this here. But think about it. I mean, even here in Tucson, how many doors do we knock on where, you know, you go into the Hispanic neighborhoods where everyone's predominantly Catholic and they have an image of Mary in the front door. I mean, just a plaque there with Mary. Or they've got Mary out in the front yard under a half-buried porcelain tub. You know, ever seen that? They take the bathtub and they put it in there and that becomes... That's they used to do that. We had it in Michigan, even in northern Michigan, in the in the uh, in the uh, Polish communities and the, out in the rural areas. I mean, they had their Catholic churches. Everybody was Catholic, you know, and they had their statues of Mary prominently displayed in the yard. Um, you know, it, it's out there to sit there and say, "Well, what are you talking about?" Maybe it's you know, uh, maybe we don't see it much in our personal life, but it is out there. Now, what if we went to one of these Catholic neighborhoods and we got some Catholic saved, you know? and they started coming to church, they might still have an affinity for their old religion. They might think, well, you know, I, I know Jesus is, how to, you know, salvation is by grace through faith. I mean, they're saved, they get it. But there could still be, you know, this fondness of, you know, having some idols around. They might say, well, what's the harm in, you know, having in my, this old statue of Mary that, you know, I've had, you know, with my grandmother's or something like that. Look, God says it's an abomination. Plain and simple. So look there, and uh, did I, you went to Revelation. I'll, I'll remind you of what it says in, a in Acts. In Acts 17, it says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, so here he is in a specific city called Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when? When he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. I mean, there can be entire cities that are just given over to this. Now we might not see that as much here in the United States, but like I said, you, you go abroad, and you go to certain countries in this world, I mean, they are given over to it. It's everywhere. 
in a lot of these in some of these other countries. So again, you know, people that might come out of these other cultures, you know, these Athenians that got saved in Paul's day, they might have had to work a little harder to, to let go of some of these these old traditions that they held hung on to. You know, the saying old habits die hard, you know, that might come into play here. And uh, even even if the person doesn't, you know, they get saved and maybe they don't have any idols per se, but they're not they're not ready to go so far as to agree with the Bible and say, well, it's an abomination. To say, yeah, I know it's not right, but you know, what's what's the big deal? Well, the Bible says it's an abomination. Well, I know, but it's just it's just my necklace. It's just you know, it's just the you know the the patron saint of you name it. <laughs> I mean, there's a patron saint for everything. You know, it's just the patron saint for making a ham sandwich. You know, or <laughs> I'm trying to think of a funny name, but I can't. You know, whatever it is. Well, that little necklace, that little graven image on there, God calls it abomination. And I know that, you know, it was grandma's and so on and so forth, but you need to get rid of it. You need to get that out of your life. Because <clears throat> God does not, you know, we're going to see that here later, that, you know, God takes a real strong stand on this. <clears throat> so why are you preaching it? Because old habits die hard. Because we are in, a, in an area that, you know, there is a certain degree of idolatry that takes place even in Tucson. <clears throat> now, look here, uh, you're going to Revelation chapter 2. The Bible says in Leviticus 19, Turn ye not unto idols, nor make to yourselves molten gods. For I am the Lord your God. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, And to the angel of the church of Pergamos, write, These things saith he which hath the sharp, uh, the, the sharp sword with two edges. So who's he writing here? Is he writing a bunch of heathen? Is he writing a bunch of unsaved heret you know, heretics, unbelievers? No, he's writing the church that is in Pergamos, saved people, right? And he goes on and says in verse 13, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not, not denied my faith, even in the days where, where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast them there, that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to do what? To eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So even in a church like this, you can see how this idolatry kind of begins to creep back in. Uh, it goes on to verse 18, another church, right? And under the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like fine, are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few good things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So again, even in these churches that you know, God is praising for their faith and their patience and their works, we can see that this idolatry is still creeping in. And a lot of it probably has to do with the fact that you know, we're, dealing with, uh, we're dealing with the Gentile nations here. You know, and it, that was, idolatry was very prevalent in the, a lot of these societies. And maybe some of them kind of you know, still kept an affinity for those old things, those, this, this, this idol worship. So what we see here is that, you know, God does not want us condoning idolatry in the slightest degree. Uh, I should have had you keep something there in 1 Corinthians 10. If you want to go back there, go to 1 Corinthians 10. But I'll begin reading in verse 25. He said, whatsoever is sold in the shambles, you know, that's talking about the, the, the markets, you know, whatever is sold in the market there. He says, that eat, ask no, asking no question for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, if any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and you be disposed to go, whatever soever is set before you eat, asking no question, question for conscious sake. So he's saying, look, if you go somewhere and they give you some food, don't ask where, you know, if it's sacrificed to idols. Because you remember back then, a lot of food, they would sacrifice it to an idol and they themselves would eat it rather than just let it go to waste. You know, and it's funny, I see this even go on here in, uh, I saw it up in Phoenix. Remember I, when we had the, the north location, I would pick up donuts in the morning. And I went on to this, this one off of Campbell. can't remember the name of the donut shop. It doesn't matter. But I went in there, and I'd get donuts, and they had the little statue. I don't know if it was Buddha or what. 
but they had a little statue down kind of on this little platform on the floor and you could see where they had left out a donut and the, and the coffee in a styrofoam cup. And the coffee had been there long enough to evaporate. You know, you could see this, the stains from where it had been. So they're like putting out coffee and donuts to this idol every day. And I, so I bought these donuts, you know, and this verse came to mind. I'm like, man, should I be serving donuts? But then I thought, well, these, they didn't tell me these were sacrificed to idols. I don't think these specific donuts. So I brought them to church and I said, eat, asking nothing for conscience sake. <laughs> you know, just <laughs> go ahead. I don't think it's a big deal, right? But, <coughs> you know, he, what he is saying here is that if a man say, verse 25, if any man say unto you, this is offered and sacrificed unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it. And for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So he's saying, look, if someone, we, and he goes on later in Corinthians and says, look, we know that an idol is nothing, that it's a false God, that it doesn't mean anything, that it's pointless. But he's saying, don't eat it, not, for your, not just for your conscience sake, but more so for him that showed it, for the sake of him that showed it. For the guy that's saying, hey, this is sacrificed to an idol, well, then I'm not going to eat because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and you need to repent of that idolatry. So you can see that God, you know, he doesn't want us condoning of idolatry to the slightest degree, okay? Now again, those of us that have no previous experience are less likely to, with, with idolatry, are less likely to struggle with this. Okay, and, and quite honestly, that's the boat I'm in. Like, I, I don't have, I don't come from a long line of, I mean, my mother was raised Catholic, but she was by no means a practicing Catholic. You know, I, I remember I, I might have gone to a Catholic church you know, I could probably count as many times on, on one hand as, as, I, as I've been there. You know, and whenever I went, you know, I was, I was getting drugged there by some Catholic aunt or something. You know, I'm, I'm looking at the statues and it's creeping me out. Because I'm growing up watching, you know, remember Unsolved Mysteries, you know, and they're always talking about the Mary statue that started to bleed, you know, cry, uh, cry uh, tears of blood. And then they had the picture of the statue used to face this way and now it's facing that way. You know, so now I'm going to the Catholic Church just expecting to see all this take place. And you know, it freaked me out. But that's about, that's about you know, the, the extent of my uh, experience with idolatry. You know, it was those few times I've been in there and saw those things. Of course, that was all just made up. You know, that's all just a big fabrication. So, you know, I really don't have a lot of experience. So it's kind of hard for me to even really preach this. And, and, and sometimes I have to scratch my head and say, is this really something that needs to be preached? But I don't know where everybody else is at. I don't know where everybody else is at in this room. Maybe this is a struggle for some people. You know, some people, maybe they did have a background with, you know, Catholicism and idolatry and things like this. And this, they need to hear this, okay? <coughs> so here's the problem with idolatry. Now, what, what's the big deal? Why is a God so intolerant of it? They were saying, don't even make them. If you make them, you're cursed. Don't even eat food that you were told was. You weren't. They weren't even there when it was sacrificed. It was, they were just told, "Hey, we sacrificed this on an idol. Don't even eat it. Have nothing to do with it." Right? God has zero tolerance. Why is that? Well, there's several reasons. One, I believe, and if you would keep something in Corinthians, I know I just had you turn there, but go over to Second uh, Chronicles chapter 33. Second Chronicles chapter 33. We'll see a you know a story here that shows us several things that are you know, wrong and dangerous about idolatry. Probably the first thing that everyone thinks of is the fact that, you know, idolatry, uh, that takes the place of the Lord, okay? Instead of pray directing your prayers towards heaven to, the, to, to Jesus Christ, you know, the Bible says there's one mediator, mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. I mean, the Bible says there's one mediator, one, and it's the man Christ Jesus. It's not Mary. There is no, you know, Mediatrix, that's not in the Bible, that's not scripture. You know, there, you don't pray to the saints. You pray to Jesus, okay, in the Spirit, and, you know, He offers those prayers to the Father. That's how we pray, okay? So, number one, the problem with idol idolatry is that you start to direct those prayers not unto the Lord, but unto some stupid image, or what the Bible calls a dumb image. Literally, calls it dumb. Not in the sense that it has a low IQ, but that because it can't speak, it doesn't talk, it's dumb, okay? And, you know, that, that, that would provoke the Lord to jealousy. That's the problem with it. The Bible says in Colossians, I'll read to you, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. 
For which things sake the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. So the Bible says that, look, these, are the, the, these things bring the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. That's the problem with idolatry. You know, I mean, that enough right there should be enough to scare us, uh, to, uh, you know, away from these sins. A scare us away from the fornication, the uncleanness, the inordinate affection, the concupiscence, the covetousness, the idolatry. We, you know, why, you know, we, we say, well, why, what's the problem? Why? Does it matter? I mean, God it brings the wrath of God. Okay? But why does God, uh, why does God have a problem with it? Well, look, well, because it takes the place of Him. The worship and the praise and that he is worthy of is directed to somewhere something else. He says there in 2 Chronicles chapter 33, verse 1, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. But he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And what were the abominations that they did? Verse 3. For he built again the high places which Hezekiah's father had broken down and reared up altars for Balaam and made groves and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. Verse 4, also he built altars in the house of the Lord, whereof the Lord said in Jerusalem shall be my name forever. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. So it's not just enough that this guy is out there when he gets into this idolatry and worshipping the hosts of heaven. Which is, by, by the way, where a lot of Greek you know, idolatry comes from. You know, all the Greek gods are named after Mars, Jupiter, Pluto. I mean, they named them after the planets that they saw in the sky, the host of heaven. But then they actually made physical carvings out of them and worshipped those as well, too. But, you know, like the, 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 the image of the Greek goddess Diana that we read about in, in, in Acts. Okay? But here's the thing. Not only do they, this guy... Manasseh goes so far as to just rear up these groves and build these altars under these false gods. He actually does it in the house of God. He goes into the temple. He goes into the house of the Lord and says, well, we're not going to worship God here anymore. We're not going to worship the Lord of heaven, the Almighty. No, we're going to worship Balaam. We're going to worship the host of heaven in these two courts. So you can see the problem with idolatry is it takes the, the worship that God is worthy of and gives it unto false gods. Okay? And not only that, but idolatry also leads to other sins that are even far worse. Okay? Look here at verse 6. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Where did he get that? He didn't get that from God. That's not, that's not the Bible. That's what was involved in this false idol worship. And if you're wondering what that means, he's saying literally that he burned his children alive. He caused his children to pass through the fire. That's what that's talking about and burning them in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Also he observed times and used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with, familiar, with a familiar spirit and with wizards. And these are things that God condemns with the death penalty. If you remember our study in, in Deuteronomy. You know, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, the Bible says. And here he is messing with it. And what was it associated with? With his idolatry. That's where I believe it began. And it led this worship of false gods and we'll see why, here in a second, why it leads you into these other sins. And he did wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to do what? To provoke him to anger. So here's the thing. God's not just going to give you a pass on idolatry. These things provoke God to anger. He's not just going to be disappointed and go, oh, gee, I'm, you know, I'm jealous. Maybe one day they'll worship me. No, God's going to get mad and he's going to do something about it. And if we recall the story of Israel, that's exactly what he did. You know, he punished them severely. <laughs> and he set, verse 7, he set a carved image in the, uh, the idol which he made in the house of God, of which God he had said to David and to Solomon, his son in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, I, will I put my name forever. Neither will I any more remove the foot of Israel from out of the land which I have appointed to your fathers, so that they will take heed to do all the com that I have commanded them, according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. So this idolatry, I mean, it leads to these wicked sins and it goes so far as it makes them worse than the heathen that God destroyed. 
which is what we're reading about, you know, in Deuteronomy, where God's getting ready to send them into land. Remember when we first started in Deuteronomy? Uh, God was commanding them to just wipe out all the Canaanites, and that they were guilty of all these abominations that we went over, the, you know, the, the, the homosexuality, the, uh, the bestiality, the incest, just all these wicked sins that, you know, just, that are, frankly, things that reprobates do, people that are rejected by God. And the Bible's saying here that, look, when Manasseh got into this stuff, he made them, Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do worse than them. That's how ba bad it made them. So idolatry is a big deal with God because one, it takes the place of him and two, it leads to other sins. Are you still in 1 Corinthians chapter 10? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We'll see that here. In verse 1 it says, Moreover, brethren, I would, that you sh uh, would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink from that same spiritual rock, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed him, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them did and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt uh, Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of the serpents. So look, this can affect God's people. This is something that if we're not careful can creep into a person's life. I mean, he's saying here, look, they all ate of that same spiritual meat. They were all baptized with Moses in the wilderness. They all drank of that same spiritual rock. But what happened to them? There were some of them that even despite all that, you know, were, were, became idolaters and they ate, they, they rose up to eat and drink. What is he referring to? He's referring to the golden calf that he made in the wilderness. And when did they make that golden calf? Was it before God had revealed himself? No, it was when God had come down in a pillar of fire upon the mount and, had spoke, and spoken to them. When, when Moses had gone up to receive the commandments of the Lord, in the meantime, they're making, at the very base of that mount, making an idolatrous calf and worshiping it. People who have seen all these things that God have done. So we shouldn't be so, you know, puffed up to think that this will never affect any of us, right? Because we don't even have any of these things. You know, all we have this, which is all we really need, honestly. But I mean, what <laughs> if people who are seeing the pillar of fire and seeing the Red Sea split and seeing the plagues of Egypt can still fall into these sins? Can't we? Sure, if we're not careful. That's why he says in verse 13, There hath no temptation you take, no hath no temptation take you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. You know, we often quote verse 13 when we're, when we're struggling with you know, certain temptations. But what's he talking about specifically in verse 14? Fleeing idolatry. He's saying, look, there's no temptation such as taking but such as is common to man. Therefore, you know, there's a way to escape. Therefore, flee what? Idolatry. And, you know, that's really the context of that, that verse. You know, the, the, the temptation and is idolatry. Now, I believe you could definitely apply that to any sin, right? Because there is no temptation, right? But he's specifically dealing with idolatry here. So how could people get into this? I mean, how, how could people... You know, get into these wicked sins like in Manasseh's day. You know, wh how is it that somebody could start worshiping an idol that end up, you know, committing child sacrifice amongst other things and getting involved with wizards and, you know, familiar spirits and doing, you know, setting up altars in God's house and doing all these wicked, blasphemous things? How does I, why does idolatry lead to that? Because at its core, whether people realize it or not, idolatry is demonic. It's demonic. It has evil, wicked spirits behind it. That's who's behind all of it. Um, and if you would, first go, go over to your 1 Corinthians 10, look at verse 19. The Bible couldn't be any clearer about this. It says, What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that that which is offered to idols is anything? But I say unto you that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. Did he say the things that they sacrifice to idols they sacrifice to just molten images. He's saying, look, what, we know it's that these, these actual physical carvings are nothing. 
He's say, that's what he's saying there. What's saying that, that the idol is anything? No, he's not saying, I'm not saying the idol is something, you know, uh, that we have to you know, worry about. The idol itself, it's what's behind the idol that we ought to be concerned about. It's what that idol represents, okay? And what does it represent? It says they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And he goes on and says, and I would not that you should have fellowship with what? With devils. So when we're getting involved with idolatry. You know, we are getting involved in, in, in demonic activity. Honestly, that's what it is. You know, the devil is sitting back and receiving that worship. You know, and if, and you know, the Bible says it's a shame to even speak of those things which are done them in secret. And I'm not real interested in trying to pull back the veil on all, the, all these occultic practices that go on out there, you know, at the end of the day, it's all demonic. But from what little bit I've heard and testimonies I've heard is that people worship, there are, there are secret societies and things like that where they worship, you know, fallen angels and they have statues built to them. I, I've heard about this and, um, and it's, it's internet stuff. I mean, who knows if it's really true. But I mean, does the Bible not say that, that when you're worshiping these idols, you're sacrificing them unto devils? Now, does a person know that, that's doing this? Do you think back in their day, in the Corinthians' day, when they're going to worship, you know, whatever Greek god they have an image of in their town, that they think, oh, this is to a devil? This is to a demonic being? No, they, they're just thinking, well, it's just this nice statue that we set up. You know, it's just been part of our religion. My family's always done this. You know, every year we go down there and we make these sacrifices and burn these incense to this statue. And what they, whether they realize it or not, the Bible says they're sacrificing to a devil. That's why it says in verse 12, you cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partaker of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Look, you can't be a Christian and say you believe this book and then practice idolatry. They don't mix. It, it's, they're opposed one to another. <clears throat> Go over to Revelation chapter 9. Say, well, that's just one verse. The Bible says over and over again that idolatry is the worship of devils. Psalms 106, you're going to Revelation 9, says, they, uh, they did not destroy the nations concerning the Lord, whom the Lord commanded them, right, this is talking about Israel, but were mingled among the heathen and learned their works. And where did they learn? They learned their heathen practice, their heathen worships, well, worship services. They learned idolatry. And they served their idols, and were a, which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils. So when, you know, they're pat ch causing their children to pass through the fire in the valley of the sons of Hinnom, when they're worshiping, worshiping these, 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 uh, Id these idols and sacrificing, the Bible says, their sons and their daughters, the Bible doesn't say they're doing it unto idols. They're doing it actually unto devils. And it makes sense because we know that the devil, he's a murderer from beginning. And all he wants to do is destroy and to rob and to kill. So whether he does it just, whether people are, you know, destroying their own children and their own lives and, and just full out open worship of Satan himself or the, whether they're doing it to some false idol under some other name, he doesn't care because his end is still accomplished. God is not getting the glory and life is being destroyed. And that's what he's all about. It says in verse 38, and shed innocent blood even the blood of their sons and, their, and of their daughters, whom they sacrifice unto the idols of Canaan. So again, the idols are devils. The Bible couldn't be any clearer. Look at Revelation chapter 9, verse 13. And the sixth angel sounded long, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed and were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year, for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand, and I heard the number of them. And I saw the horses in their vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of janseth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three were the, uh, were the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and, which, uh, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of their hands, that they should not worship devils. So he's punishing these people 
And these people still wouldn't get it right. And you'd think, if someone's going to get right with God, this would be the time to do it. <laughs> and you're being hunted down by these just hundred, a thou, you know, these, these thousands upon hundreds of thousands of these just crazy creatures with, you know, horses with heads and tails like scorpions. I mean, if there was a time to get right with God, this is it, people. But they wouldn't. And they would not repent of what? Their worship of devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone of wood. God's saying, look, whether it's an idol of brass or gold or silver or wood or porcelain, anything you want to make it out of, it's, at the end of the day, it's a devil. It's the worship of devils. Whether the people realize it or not. So you're not only is, are you robbing God of the glory that he deserves, but you're actually giving that glory unto a devil when you are involved in idolatry. And here's the thing. You know, say, well, you know what? No one here has got a little statue of Buddha at home. And no one here is putting out donuts to Buddha every day. You know, no one here is, you know, we've taken down the statue of Mary in the backyard or whatever. And that's, you know, I was, recall, you know, when I was writing this, I remembered somebody here, I know we went out, we were out soul winning in one of these neighborhoods, and they sent me a picture of that, you say, idol, is this really that prevalent? Who sent me that picture of that? They had like a pyramid built in the front yard. Was it you? Yeah, it was like, a, I mean, how tall was that thing? It was like 15 feet high, like this literal pyramid on the top. Didn't it have like a statue of Mary on the top? Well, don't tell me this stuff isn't out there. It's, it's like less than a mile from here, maybe a mile from here. I mean, they don't, their yard wasn't that very big to begin with. I mean, that neighborhood isn't, it isn't exactly, you know, Beverly Hills or something like that. I mean, it's, it's pretty quaint homes and some modest yards, you know. But these people, they were so devout to Mary that they took that nice section of their yard and instead of putting out lawn chairs you know, or, or a nice garden or something like that. They built this brick pyramid and put a statue of Mary on top. You know, and, and we laugh at it, and it's funny, I mean, because it's just, it's kind of over the top, I mean, even for that. You know, but what's sad about it is that person, they have such devotion to this thing, and the Bible says that whether they realize it or not, it's, it's demonic in nature what they're doing. <coughs> and here's the thing, you know, we might never be guilty of that. You know, I don't think anyone here has probably got that going on in their house. You know, and if you do, you're going to have a hard time hiding it. You might as well just get out right now, because I'll tell you what, that thing was huge. But it can take, idolatry can take form in, in other ways in our lives. In our lives. You know, uh, idolatry can manifest itself in other ways in our lives. Maybe not in a physical thing that we actually build and, and worship and stuff like that. But the Bible did say, we read it earlier, that covetousness is idolatry. You know, that we can make a God out of, mo out of money. You know, the almighty dollar, that phrase. It's because people do. They devote their life and their energy and their worship to making money. You know, that could, that could fall. We could fall into that easily. If we became covetous people and we just made God uh, or made, uh, made money our God. Instead of going to, wor going to church, we're just going to work more. You know, instead of reading our Bible, we're going to, you know, read the you know, rich dad, poor dad or something. I don't know. You know what I mean? We could, there's ways to do that. And that wouldn't be too far-fetched. I mean, people do do that. <coughs> so here's the thing. If you would, go over to Psalms chapter 15, and we'll, we'll wrap it up here. You know, we shouldn't make light of idolatry. You know, we, we do, we, we kind of joke about it, because it is funny when we see some of these crazy things that people do. But we have to remember at the end of the day that, you know, people are, are, are lost, and they stay lost because of these things. Because they get so hung up on their on their traditions, and their you know their they they don't want to let this go, and they have lots of ways they're going to defend these idols and this idol worship to the bitter end. And you know, it, it's unfortunate because you know idolatry will keep people some people from getting saved. I believe that that some people are are going to get so offended that you would even suggest that it's demonic in nature that they're just going to totally dismiss anything else you have to say. But uh, did I not, I mean, what, what at the end of the day, you have to say to those people, well, what's your final authority? Is it this book or is it a church? Is it this book or is it the Pope? You know, any honest Catholic will tell you it's the Pope. And, you know, and I've, I know a few, Cat I mean, died in the world, hardcore Catholics with, you know, statues of Mary in the bedroom, you know, on the dresser. And you, tr you confront them with the Bible and they say, yeah, but that's what the Bible says. The Pope says. Yeah, but the Catholic Church teaches. 
okay, but that's fine. And if you want to do that, go ahead, but just understand something. This book isn't your authority then. You know, you're, you've put your faith and trust in a man, in, in, in the father, you know, of <laughs> that uh, somebody who's calling himself Papa, you know, and dresses like Mama. And the Bible says not to call any man upon earth your father, for there is one in heaven which is your father. You know, and so on, and, and, and it's unfortunate, you know, because people are going to die and go to hell because of things like this, because of idolatry, because they're going to get so offended that a Baptist preacher would get up and tell it like it is from the book. And that they're not going to want to hear the gospel. They're just going to dismiss it. Look at Psalms 135. Did I have you go there? Psalms 135. <coughs> it says in verse 3, But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. You know, I'm glad that my God today isn't in some stupid statue that came off an assembly line. You know, I'm, I'm glad it's not, he's not plastered on the side of a candle that you can buy at the dollar store. That's not where my God is. You know, my God isn't hanging, you know, isn't depicted hanging on the cross in some Catholic church somewhere. You know, the cross is empty, friend. Why do you want to have an image of Jesus constantly crucified in front of us? You know, he came down off the cross, was buried, and rose again. We look unto Jesus in the heavens. You know, we see God, we see the Lord in this book, not in some depiction made by man, Okay. My God, our God is in the heavens. He had done whatsoever he pleased. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. They have feet, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. Saying, look, they have everything, you know, they were careful to put the eyes and the ears and the nose and the hands and the feet, but none of those things work because they're useless, because it's not real. Right? When look at verse 8, and he says, They that make them are like unto them. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. What does he mean by that? Well, I mean, they have eyes, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. They're blind. They can't hear. They don't move. They're not alive. They're dead. And people that are trusting in these things, they're spiritually dead. They're just like their dumb idol. They can't see. They can't hear. And they're never going to speak. The word, you know, they're never going to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, they can, but this can be a real hang-up for people. So don't make light of idolatry. Just don't be like, yeah, I know they're Catholic and whatever. Oh, they're Buddhist and it's just a statue they have. Look, friend, that thing can late. Well, if they're trusting in that, they'll lead them straight to hell. Okay? So don't make, uh, don't make light of it. You know, and I don't think anybody is, but if you're guilty of it, get right or get out. Yeah, that's the title of, of the sermon. So let's go ahead and pray.